We've been in a series for several weeks called God Speaks, and we are doing something unique. We're taking two weeks on several big Old Testament prophet books. And our goal is to try to introduce you to some scriptures you may not be familiar with and to maybe entice you not only to think of them as friends instead of strangers, but also maybe to do a little reading and exploring on your own because these are some great books that are kind of a fabric for the New Testament that we, we understand the context is, is built on the Old Testament. So one of the inter- things we've introduced you to is called Bible Project, and it's a great resource for you. Uh, it gives you basically a whole Bible school course in a very short order, so we play a little bit of each of those, and we're going to show you a little bit about what the book of Isaiah is about, and then we'll be jumping into uh, chapter 6 if you have your Bibles. Let's watch this. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived in Jerusalem in the latter half of Israel's kingdom period, and he spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He spoke first of all a message of God's judgment. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would come at a cost, that God was going to use the great empires of Assyria and after them Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But that announcement was combined with a message of hope. Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all of his covenant promises, that he would send a king from David's line to establish God's kingdom, remember 2 Samuel 7, that he would lead Israel in obedience to all of the laws of the covenant made at Mount Sinai, remember Exodus chapter 19. And all of this was so that God's blessing and salvation would flow outward to all of the nations, like God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it's this hope that compelled Isaiah to speak out against the corruption and idolatry of Israel in his day. Now the book has a pretty complex literary design, but there's one simple way to see how it all fits together. Chapters 1 through 39 contain three large sections that develop Isaiah's warning of judgment on Israel. And it all culminates in an event pointed to at the end of chapter 39, the fall of Jerusalem and the exile of the Babylon. But in chapters 1 to 39, there's also a message of hope that after the exile, God's covenant promises would all be fulfilled. And chapters 40 to 66 pick up that promise of hope and develops it further. Got that? So uh, Jan and I had a chance to go see uh, Ronnie and Jeremy and our grandkids back in Ohio. And as I was flying on the plane, I was reminded of this story of two guys that were sitting together on a plane, and the one guy was just complaining. You know, there wasn't enough room for his knees, and there, you have to fight over the, uh, the center elbow armrest, and, and the food was like, you know, barely edible, and he was complaining about everything. And finally, his seatmate looks over him, and he said, dude, you are flying at 30,000 feet in the air, 500 miles an hour. We are taking in a four and a half hours what would take you four days to drive. And if you'd been in a covered wagon, it would have taken you three months. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> and I think that's a great story for us. Because sometimes our life gets focused on the uncomfortability of what's going on immediately. And we're focused on our health or our finances or our relationships. And we're, we're concerned about the small details of our life. And, and some particularly are oriented towards being Eeyore and everything is bad. And sometimes even as Christians we look at the world around us and the sin that's around us. And we get into a hand-wringing, ain't things awful kind of a place. And we have forgotten the 30,000 feet view. We've forgotten who God is and what his plan is. We've forgotten that he's invited us to be a part of his kingdom. We've forgotten that he sent his son to die on the cross so we could have life. And we've forgotten the big stuff. And so in the book of Isaiah, we're going to start with the big stuff. How God tapped Isaiah on the shoulder and said, I've got some work for you to do. But before that, he showed him a fresh vision of himself. And I just want to say this at the beginning. If your life is made up of all the struggles and difficulties and details, if that's what you've been thinking about, that's what you've been living out of, then let me invite you to have a fresh view of God. 
And feel free to yell amen every once in a while if you feel like it and God speaks to you. Yeah. Because this is a big deal. And we need to be stirred up every now and again because we get stagnant and, and get cold. And the Bible term is we get hard-hearted. And God needs to stir us up and break up the fallow ground, break up the, the hardness of our heart and bring us back again to the, oh, wow, kind of worship. Instead of, oh, yeah. I already know that. So, with that introduction, I'm going to give you a test. We've been talking about this time frame, and it's important for you to have an awareness of the big story of the Bible and not just the stories of the Bible. And as a pastor, I've had some funny questions asked to me, like, is the Joseph that got sold by his brothers, was he the father of Jesus? It's like, they're both named Joseph. That's the only commonality we have here. But, but if you only learn stories and don't have a picture of the big story, then you're missing out. So we've been trying to give you some hooks to hang things on, big dates in the Old Testament, and so I want to see how you're doing. So David lived around the year 1,000. We have one respondent. Thank you. <laughs> Any of the rest of you want to play? We talked about how the northern kingdom, the group called Israel, that it was divided from the southern kingdom. God warned them and warned them and warned them. And then finally they went into captivity in the year... Anybody on this side of the room? 722, man. You were good in school, weren't you? And the fall of Judah, which is what we've been looking at, which is the time period of Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah, the prophets we've been looking at already, they were clustered around and at the time of and affected by the exile of the southern kingdom, which was around year what? <laughs> After 722, he said. So, Thank you, that was so helpful. 586. And the time of Jesus... <laughs> I was going to say, I thought that's one you would get, but it's not zero, it's probably about 6 B.C., truth of the matter. So if you have some hooks at 1,000, 722, 586, that helps you fit stories in between. And I find that is a helpful piece as we start looking at this whole of the, the story of the Old Testament. And we've been talking about the, the prophets that are around the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the southern kingdom. So just like Star Wars had a story and then they had a prequel, today we're doing the prequel because the, is the Isaiah stories, the, the time of Isaiah and Micah and Amos are all around 150, 60 years before that, which is around the fall of Israel. So these two kingdoms that were connected together by being part of the Israelites, they had a civil war, they divided the northern kingdom was taken, first of all, to a, by Assyria, to Assyria. And that should have been a warning to the southern kingdom of Judah. Because what it said is God prophesied this, God told us it was going to happen, and sure enough, it did. And so that should have brought them to a place of obedience. And instead, they forgot and followed exactly the same failures as the, the neighbors to the north, as their fellow countrymen. Isaiah is a prophet who speaks not only powerfully, but poetically. It's a lot of beautiful scriptures. A lot of uh, Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament. If you start reading through Isaiah, you're going to go, oh, that's a Christmas verse, or oh, I remember that one. So I want to just read to you, God called Isaiah to speak to the, the sin of the nation. I want to just read to you from chapter 5. You don't even have to turn there. Just listen to the cadence and the beauty and ask yourself if it sounds like something closer to home than 722 B.C. Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and they are left alone in the land. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets and pipes and tendrils and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and no respect for the work of his hands. Woe to those who drag sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. 
Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deny justice to the innocent. Does that sound uh, thousands of years old? Or does that sound kind of current? It does, doesn't it? Is that a, could all of those be read to our country right now? Yeah. Especially that picture that says they call evil good and good evil. It's not just that people are doing evil. It's they're turning evil into now a, a thing to celebrate and a, a thing to say this is the good. And God's plan and God's words and God's picture has become bad. Those people that are, are extremes, extremists and fundamentalists and they, they're dangerous. And so God called Isaiah to speak to a world like yours and mine. And he got him, he called him, and in order to equip him for that, he gave him a powerful vision of himself. And what God wanted to impress on Isaiah before he had to stand and speak, and, and God already told him, frankly, just like Jeremiah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have you say this, and they're not going to listen to you, but say it anyway, because it's part of my witness to these people that I told them what was going to happen and I'm telling them the truth and they don't like it but that's okay and isn't it interesting it says in the last days you will have people who want teachers to tickle their ears instead of to tell them the truth people don't necessarily want the truth do they because it's uncomfortable so God says to Isaiah before you head out into this ministry I'm going to give you I need you to have a fresh view of me and what it says in Isaiah chapter 6 is God is awesome. And you know what? We way overuse the word awesome. Kitty videos are not awesome. A little kid hitting a home run is not awesome. Those are good things. But we awesome everything. And when everything's awesome, nothing's awesome. And we need to get back to where we see God as powerful, holy, wise, as he is. Instead of just the man upstairs. Instead of just putting him on the edge of our life to call on when we need him or when we get into trouble. And so I want to read these verses through with you of what God took Isaiah through. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now that's a time marker. Uh, it was a time in his ministry where the king, he, he actually served under four kings. And Uzziah was the first king. And it was about 740 B.C. when he died. And Uzziah had been a godly king, but instead of letting the priests do the altar, the fire on the altar of God in the temple, Uzziah decided he was going to do it. And because of that, he was struck with leprosy. So he was the leper king for the last years of his life. And when he died, God says, I'm calling you, Isaiah, to this new job, to stand up and speak for me. So he says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two wings they covered their feet, and two wings they were flying. So he's in the temple in Jerusalem, or near that, and God evidently opens his eyes to see the spiritual world. And so he can see God and this temple where they think God lives. It's like, no, actually, that's the hem of his garments there. That's the very bottom. And here's God, and he shows him a glimpse of God surrounded by these heavenly creatures. They're called seraphim. And I tried to find you a picture of them, but every picture is weird that they tried to make because this is kind of beyond our understanding. And, and if you think of how many odd creatures there are when you go to the zoo and how God is amazingly creative, just wait till you get to heaven. There's a whole new crew that we haven't even seen of heavenly beings that are there to worship and praise God and they are not animals, they are powerful beings. And it shows them, it shows God seated on a throne. He is the king of the universe. And the seraphim were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now that wasn't the view that Isaiah had of the world. 
He saw the world as falling apart. He saw the world as moving away from God. He saw the world as heading towards destruction. He saw grief and death and bloodshed coming. And God said, you know what? The whole earth is still full of the glory of God. We just need eyes to see it. Because everything that God is doing is to bring Him glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So God took an ordinary temple worship time, and all of a sudden He peeled back the, the visible bounds, and He let Him see Himself for a bit. And it's, it's interesting, there's a lot of places in the Bible at, at Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments, in Revelation when it shows the King of kings and the Lord of lords sitting on a throne and the 24 elders are around him and they fall down in front of him and what do they say? Same thing, holy, holy, holy. So before Isaiah was going to speak to the people, he needed to have a fresh view of God. There's a, a great book by, John, or by Paul David Tripp called Awe. And he basically expands this same theme that we need to have a resounding, fresh view of the God that we serve so that we live in awe. Because his statement that I think is so clear is that when we develop awe amnesia, we become spiritually anemic. And when we develop a low view of God, what happens is we begin to awe at so many other things. He calls it awe wrongness. We get awed by our own opinion. We get awed by the stars. We get awed by fancy new cars. We get awed by technology. We get awed by all kinds of other things. And we lose the perspective of the awe of God. And we need to get God back to where He belongs. And we need to see Him. And sometimes we use the word the fear of the Lord and people sometimes don't resonate well with that idea of fear, but that's what the, the word awe means, that incredible awareness. And, and if you can think of what Isaiah experienced, God peeled back the, the, the veil to see the invisible, and he saw God, and it says things shook, and the smoke came, and it was a God of power. God has power, the most power in the universe. He can do anything he wants to do. Nothing is impossible for God. God is all-knowing. He knows everything, past, present, and future. God fills the universe. He is omnipresent. And too often we get God boiled down to a, a little picture of when I talk to God, what I think of Him as my friend upstairs. And we pull God down from being holy and high and lifted up and we make Him like our big buddy upstairs. And because of that, we don't live in the awe of God that we should in fact, I would say one of the symptoms of it is you're more concerned that other people find out about your sins than you are that God sees you. Most people who do something wrong spend all their time trying to cover it up so other people won't find out, which has nothing to do with the God that's watching you all the time. And God knows not only what you do, He knows what you think. Isn't that a scary thought? I mean, for most of us, even if we could have what we thought all this last week up there on the screen, we'd run out of here. But God says, I see all of that and I know all of that. And Isaiah got a powerful picture of who God was. And the only response, if you see God for who He is, is surrender. You know why I know we have an awe problem? Because we're control freaks. Why would you want to control your life instead of letting the king of the universe who created everything, who knows everything past and present and future? Who do we think we are? And I don't know if you noticed that one of the woes is woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. You see, we begin to think that God's rules and God's laws and God's plan is second rate. We can do better. And we think we're smarter than God. So the first thing is when you see God who is awesome, then we respond with surrender and giving up and saying, okay, God, you, it's all you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to follow your plan whether I understand it or not. And the second piece that you see here in those same verses is that God is holy. 
And holy means pure, absolute goodness. In fact, the word means to be separate, to be so divided from anything that is evil and, and vulgar and wrong. And, and you and I honestly have mixed feelings about holiness. Holiness is good. It's good to be right and pure and just. But as soon as you and I feel like, wow, we are in the presence of a holy God, you know what happens? Same thing happened to Isaiah. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Here's an irony. The more you grow in your spiritual maturity, the more sensitive to sin you should become. And I think we actually do it the the backwards way. We think that when somebody comes in here and they're fresh off the street, they don't know anything about God, their life is like all their parts in a box and their relationships are screwed up and they speak filthy language and they don't have any good habits and they have all bad habits. We think, now that's a sinner. And then after we've cleaned up 30 years and after we've got all the right language and after we've got our, at least our external life so that it looks good, Sometimes we don't have any more conviction of sin. We, we feel like all those things that go on in my head, they're not that big a deal. And I don't know about you, but I have a master's degree in rationalization. <laughs> have you ever noticed how other people's sins are much worse than mine? I've noticed that. <laughs> and we have a minor degree in blaming And interestingly enough, we live in a world that is definitely calling evil good and good evil. And not only, I read an article about California, a bulletin to California teachers, and you're dealing with 12-year-olds and you can't say anything about whatever gender they might be and you certainly can't say what sexual orientation they might be and you certainly now can't even say that two people together is the ideal. You could have three or four and there are some kids that even self-identify as animals and we've got to make room for that. And you realize that when you lose God's picture of this is right and this is wrong, it can go anywhere. And what happens is it's easy for us to become judgmental. You see, the picture here is God sitting on the throne and he is the judge of the universe. He's the one that says what's right and what's wrong. And you and I, especially as we mature in the Lord and learn more of his ways, it's easy for us to want to become the judges. And it's easy for us to become high and lifted up (laughs) instead of God. And you know what people need? They need Jesus. That's what they need is they need a moral compass that comes in the person of Christ. They need to get saved. They need rightness from God. And what we often substitute is criticism from ourselves. And that's not to say we can't speak out against what is evil and wrong, because obviously that's what God called Isaiah to do. But listen, I was was studying this through and I thought, before God asked Isaiah to speak to the wickedness of his people, he wanted him to see the wickedness of his own heart. Why? Because then you speak with humility. God God did that for me in a, a point in time, which I have never forgotten, where We were at a conference and there was an altar call for pastors to just go up and to confess anything that God was pointing out in our lives that might be hindering our life and our ministry. And and in a few moments kneeling there, I felt like God kind of revealed to me how sin isn't something that I do on occasion when I'm tempted in a specific way, but that sin, my old nature is all through everything. And I believe that the most clear evidence in our lives of our sinful nature is our deep selfishness. Is that we don't want to make things all about the glory of God. We really want to make things all about the glory of me. And, I, you know, you want to have that sign on your house that says, I'm the captain, please be reasonable, do it my way. And what happens, what happened is I realized that at my best moment, trying to do the best thing I could do, trying to serve God, there is still a core of selfishness. Because I am pouring my life out, I want to serve God, but you better be impressed. You better be appreciative. You better say thank you. You better say, that was great. Because when I am giving myself and people criticize me, then I am angry, I'm, I'm resentful. Why? 
because there's a whole lot of me that still wants the glory of me and not the glory of God. And I suspect you're the same way. That we are shot through with sinfulness. That sin isn't something we do occasionally. That our sin nature is something that only can be overcome by the power of the Spirit of God within us. And so what happens is when we see God as the judge, our response is repentance. To say, you're right, God, I need to confess that that is just as ugly in me as it is in them. That sin is wrong. That I put other people in the place of you, God. I put myself in the place of God way too often. And you know the the chief idea behind that is that we want to be on the throne. We were talking about this with our teaching team and and uh, Pastor Ed says, you know, I see that in my life. He said, every, every morning I wake up and I'm on the throne. And God says, you've got my chair. You've got my seat. And I have to surrender and wrestle with that. And then Heather said, I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm more on the beating myself up about everything. She said, every morning when I wake up, I'm in the ditch. And I need to remember that not only is God on the throne, but that God has chosen me. And that I am at the foot of the throne because I'm related to him. And I thought, what a, what a powerful picture of repentance. That we come with all wrongness. And uh, in that book, he has, a, he has a whole chapter which he says, here's the symptoms of having lost our fresh awe of God. We move to self-centeredness and entitlement. Discontent with our lives. Relational dysfunction. We seek for control, we live in fear, we get angry about things, we get envious of other people's toys. There's a drivenness that leads to exhaustion. There's spiritual doubt that leads to spiritual coldness. He said those are symptoms of awe, amnesia. And I believe that we struggle with this a lot, that we need to get back to seeing who God is. And because of that, Repentance means to turn away, to change my heart, to change my mind. It means that when I see God for who he is, the automatic response is, oh man, I need help. I need the rescuing grace of Jesus today. And that's the third thing that comes in this story. As you see what God's response is, it says, one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now the altar of the temple was where they gave the sacrifices which was a picture of Christ who was to come. It was their way of saying to God, our sins are more than we can handle. Please forgive us. And he took a coal from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. You see, we sometimes have this wrong division that says the God of the Old Testament's mad and the God of the New Testament's mushy, lovey. And it's the same God. And all the way through the Old Testament, there are pictures of God's grace and God's mercy. What does God do when Isaiah realizes his sin? Does he go, yeah, you're a worm. You're awful. No, he says, I've got the solution. And he sends him with this coal from the altar, which in our New Testament covenant is a picture of what Christ has done. Your sin is atoned for. You've forgiven So that we see that there's a God full of grace. A God who gives instead of the punishment that we deserve, instead of the rejection from a holy God, it's the God who brings us in and he forgives us and he draws us close. And you and I need to review and preach the gospel to ourselves every day. I remember growing up in church that as soon as they started talking about the gospel, I thought, well, I'm all past that. I'm a Christian, I gave my life to Christ, they're going to give an altar call, it's not even going to bother me. And I realized how foolish that was. You never get beyond the gospel. The gospel is the core of everything. And it's like the foundation principles, it's like the fundamentals of basketball, you never get beyond those. And God wants to stir us up again and remind us of what's real. And I think sometimes the story we tell ourselves is the fake gospel. The fake gospel is I was kind of bad. Not really, I was still a pretty good person. I was kind of bad. Jesus helped me out. I needed a little assist. 
and I live mostly in my own strength, and I'm a pretty good person. When we don't realize the depth of our sinfulness, then the salvation of Jesus is not great news. It's just nice. You see, if you minimize the problem, you trivialize the solution. Let me say that again. If you minimize the problem, then you trivialize the solution. Because here's the real gospel. The real gospel is I was totally lost. I was sinful. I wasn't as bad as I could be, but I was so bad that I could never be in the presence of a holy God. And you know what? By ourselves, we frankly don't even want to. We don't want to pray. We don't want to obey. We, want to, we don't want to do anything with God. We run away from God. And when you realize that no matter how you grew up in Sunday school and you were a good person all your life, that you're still shot through with sin all over when you start realizing the desperate cancer that we have, then you realize that Jesus' life is the coal from the altar that comes and it says, now your sin is atoned for. And more than that, his life provides life for me. The good news of the gospel isn't that you get to go to heaven when you die. The good news of the gospel is your sins are forgiven, you get to live with God while you're here. That Jesus died for us so he, could live, so he could live in us, so he could live his life through us. That's different than me trying harder because I'm sort of bad. I've got to work on it a little bit. And frankly, some people come to church to improve their moral score instead of to meet with a holy God and find forgiveness and life. And then if I understand that I live in his power and his strength, I get up every morning and I say, okay, God, the throne is yours. And today I want to live out of that. I want to be your ambassador. I want to be your light. I want, to, I want to be somebody that you can use in this messed up world that we live in. And when I realize how broken I am, I realize how desperate I need him. And then I come to a life that's filled with obedience. Not out of fear, not out of obligation, not out of wanting to please other people. When I put God on the throne, then I want to live a life of serving my, my king I want to live a life of pouring out myself for him and for others. Why? Because that is this deep gratitude. And let me just tell you, I think one of the signs of a hard heart, of awe amnesia, is a lack of gratefulness. We are a blessed people. We have been given so many things, spiritually and financially and physically. And yet we can easily be the gripiest people on the planet. Why? Because the more you have, the more you want. That lust is unquenchable. And when you come to see what God has done and who He is, and that the King of glory has invited me and adopted me to be His child, and I can live out of the bondage of sin, and I can live with heaven on earth now, then I want to do it. I want to come to church. I, I want to read my Bible. I want to spend time with God. When you see God correctly, the right motivations bubble up automatically. When you don't, you're trying to do a checklist of how to improve your moral score. That's called religiousness. And it generally leads toward deadness instead of life. So what happens in Isaiah's story? God says, I need you, Isaiah. I don't need you. I've just got a job for you. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I don't know how this really worked, but it sounds like the story in my head is the king sitting on the throne. Who's in the audience? One guy, right? As far as we know, Isaiah's there by himself. He says, I need a volunteer. Any of you interested? And Isaiah says, that'd be me. That'd be me. You see, God had chosen Isaiah, but Isaiah had to choose God. And there was a friend of mine who was involved in foster care and then adoption of some kids, and one of his sons had a fetal alcohol syndrome and failure to bond, and they, they had fits with him all the way through his growing up years. And he told me about a conversation they had when they walked down the beach when the kid was about 17, and he was having trouble, and he's rebelling, and he was wanting to do his own thing. And, and Wayne said to him, you know, we chose you when you were, I think, about seven, 
And we have poured our life into you and we've given you this and we've given you that and we've brought you into our family. And then he looked at him and he said, we chose you, now you have to decide, are you going to choose us? Are you going to let us be your family? Isn't that a poignant moment? And isn't that what God does? I've given you all this. I've drawn you. I've poured into you. Are you going to choose me? And I'll tell you that when you say yes, that the response is a a holy, awesome fear of God. The response is believing that God is holy and that I am not and that I need His holiness because I've got none of my own. It means that out of joy, I say, God, I want to serve. I want to do something for you. That we shouldn't have to try to find people to work at church. There should be a a waiting list of people getting in. We shouldn't have to try to say, you only serve at church. You ought to be serving in your neighborhood, in your community, and you ought to be serving everywhere you can because you belong to the King of glory. And God needs to stir us up because we get cold and hard and forgetful and we have all amnesia. We forget that we're in an airplane at 30,000 feet. And because of that, we live with a blindness. And so my challenge to us is that you let the book of Isaiah give you a fresh view of God. And, and by the way, God did not give him an easy assignment. God said to him, I'm going to tell you to go speak to my people and they're not going to listen. In fact, God tells first assignment, tell them, I'm going to close your eyes, I'm going to close your ears so you can't hear. You say, what kind of message is that? Well, the answer is, people say, God needs to judge America. I want to tell you, God is judging America. And part of the judgment is a giving over to sin and a blindness and a spiritual apathy. And that that's a symptom of the problem. And God sends him out to be a light in a world that's as messed up as ours. And so God sends us out in the same way. I'm going to hand off to the Green Campus and to South Umqua. I love you guys. Let me give you a couple of challenges. I want to encourage you every day this week to say, I need to preach the gospel to myself. I need to remind myself of the goodness of God and the lostness of me. I need to be grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus and the fact that I've been adopted to be his family that he's called me his own. And I need to surrender and say, God, today I want to do what you want me to do. My to-do list is yours. And that you live that way. Because I want to tell you, when God calls you, he always interrupts your list. And you got to be aware, got to be available, got to be paying attention. And secondly, we need to say and tell the truth, which is what the word confess means. We need to confess how great God is and we need to confess how we aren't. And confession gives power to the Spirit in humility to say, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And when you acknowledge that, that doesn't beat you down, that actually gives the Spirit openness to not only come in and bring forgiveness, but to give you power to change, which is what we desperately need. We're going to conclude the service with some songs and a prayer here, but I want you to think of it as a time for you to reflect and let God work in you and hold up your heart and say, God, if my heart's hard, soften it. God, give me a fresh view of you. And if God shows you specific sins that you need to confess, do it. If God shows you he's calling you to something, say, okay, here am I. But use this time of prayer and of reflection in song. Use it as a time of saying, God, I want to set my heart on you. I choose you. Father, thank you for the book of Isaiah. Thank you for the stories from history that show how you're the holy and good and right one and that you are calling people to live with you in spite of the messed up world we live in. And help us to get our attention off the messed up world and back on you. And help us to be as willing to confess our own sins as to confess others. And help us, God, to have a heart that says, here I am, send me. Send me to my family, send me to my neighbor, send me to my school, send me to represent you. 
Not because I'm any great things, but because I'm a good example of what you can do with a nobody. Father, help us to set our hearts on you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.